Welcome to the Blue Security Podcast, a weekly podcast for information security defenders, where we bring you discussions on best practices, tools, and implementation for enterprise security. Now, here are your hosts for today's show, Andy Ja and Adam Brewer. Welcome to the Blue Security Podcast. I'm Andy, your host. And I'm Adam, your co-host. This week, there's been a lot of more news about cyber attacks, and I think this is starting to become the norm. I've seen a lot of mainstream media report on cyber attacks now, and just going through my RSS feed for the last week, there have been several companies, high-profile companies, that have disclosed breaches, cyber attacks against them or ransomware. For example, McDonald's recently revealed that they had a data breach resulting in theft of customer and employee info. EA Games was in the news. They were breached, and it was actually via a social engineering attack over Slack where they were coerced to provide a login token. And the attackers stole 780 gigs of data, the source code for FIFA 21, uh, the Frostbite engine source code that powers Battlefield, There was a food service supplier, Edward Don, that was hit by ransomware also this week. They're one of the largest distributors of food service equipment supplies, such as kitchen supplies and bar supplies, flatware and dinnerware. And they do that like all through the United States. Um, And so they were hit as well. Another high profile one was CD Projekt, which they're the developers for Witcher 3 and the game that came out recently called Cyberpunk 2077. And they were breached back in February via ransomware. And they had about 346 gigs of game data stolen, the entire source code of Cyberpunk 2077. And that's now circulating on the internet. Jokes on them, it barely works. (laughs) Which was funny, too. I saw a couple comments that said, you know, now the bugs can get fixed. (laughs) Uh, Spain's Ministry of Labor and Social Economy had services taken down after a cyber attack. And this was after they'd gotten hit by Ryuk ransomware just back in March. And then, of course, there were a couple of the payments that were broadcast for some of the ransomware. JBS, which was the world's largest beef producer. They were hit out with ransomware on May 31st, and it was disclosed that they paid $11 million to Revil, the ransomware group. Uh, that was after they demanded a $22.5 million ransomware, so they ended up paying 11 of that. Also in the news was Colonial Pipeline again. The Justice Department was able to recover $2.3 million dollars in Bitcoin after they had paid nearly five million total. And that was mainly because of the fluctuation of the price of Bitcoin, but still, you know, out of pocket, they still lost uh, over two million dollars. And then when I was researching this episode on the amount of money that's being paid to ransomware, the one that missed me in May was CNA Financial, which apparently is one of the US's largest insurance companies. They paid out forty million dollars to a ransomware attacker that initially they demanded $60 million. And that, I believe, is the highest known payout of money to a ransomware uh, attacker. So, you know, there's, you know, just starting off with the news, I mean, this stuff is happening all the time. If you're not, if you haven't been in cybersecurity or you're not following cybersecurity news, you may not, see it but you know for us who have been in the industry we've known that these attacks are happening and they're happening with higher and higher frequency but i think now it's starting to really trickle into people's lives and people are starting to pay attention it feels like we've hit an inflection point andy we talked about this on the pre-show a little bit that Things like Colonial Pipeline affected people trying to put gas in their car. It's very visceral. It's very real. JBS is a major beef producer. When you can't get a product at the grocery store and it's because of a cyber attack, 
that starts to affect people. So even though people might not know Colonial Pipeline, they might not know JBS before, they certainly know that they like to be able to get gasoline. They certainly know they like to be able to buy beef. And when they're impacted by that, it, it starts to cross over in the mainstream. So it really feels like this is starting to be an inflection point of like, holy smokes, this is this is not just like a couple of companies that, you know, were looking the other way when somebody's broken the back door or, you know, had really poor practices. Like these are sophisticated companies like Electronic Arts that got hit with a really sophisticated social engineering attack. And it just shows you like the amount of attack vectors, the opportunities to get in are so great. And then you talk about the dollar amounts here and how high they are. That's lucrative. I mean, Andy, I, you know, I thought about it for a second, like, man, are we in the wrong business here? <laughs> like, you know, that that's, that's a ton of money. And that attracts new entrants into that space that, that becomes attractive. Like, Hey, I could do that. You know, I could go break into somebody and, and shake them down for some Bitcoin and that's only going to increase the volume and sophistication and frequency of attacks moving forward because when it's so possible to get paid for this work, it makes it drive further recruitment and investment and effort to continue because it works. It is resulting in payouts. Now, if there wasn't any money in the business, people wouldn't be doing it, but it's become really lucrative. And so... This is, um, it just feels like a tipping point. And I think we're going to talk about that as we go along today. I think back even in the history of some of the ransomware attacks that I just pull off of memory, it's affected people's lives before, but I just think that right now it's, it's starting to happen with more frequency. Like I think back, there was an attack on Atlanta's transit system a few years ago, and they had to shut down all the payments to the transit system system because they couldn't process any payments. So they just made it free for everyone for like a couple of weeks until they could restore, you know, and then there were stories of school systems getting hit where their lesson plans were uh, erased or encrypted. Mm -hmm. And so they had to actually delay school by a couple of weeks because the teachers didn't have their lesson plans or they couldn't enter in the grades or attendance or anything like that. So Andy, that, that happened here locally in the Des Moines area where I live, our local community college, Des Moines, Des Moines area community college, or locally known as DMAC has had to cancel several days of classes because they got hit with a ransomware attack here locally. And so they have not had summer classes for several days. I don't know if they've had class all week to that exact point. So, I mean, hitting close to home, that's another kind of example where it's not just something that happens to somebody else anymore. It's not just something that happens in California or New York or big States. I mean, here in Iowa, capital city, Des Moines, Iowa, we're, we're having it too. So it's, it's real and it's really starting to affect people's day-to-day -day lives. Right. I think of the, the images coming out of Ireland where their public health system, HSE uh, suffered a ransomware attack. And they very famously said, we are not going to pay. And they have a list of impacted services on, it will take longer to do this. This is not possible right now. We can't communicate between different hospitals. So it's harder to get consults and have radiologists look at things and, and all sorts of stuff like that. And the images that came out of it were the Irish military re-imaging Windows 7 machines. Yeah, Windows 7 machines, like I didn't misspeak there. And just the imagery of it alone is astounding looking at that and thinking of this, this crippled public health system because of a ransomware attack. It's, it's just, it's not just a target thing anymore. You know, it's real, it's real, real, and it's really affecting people's lives. And the volume is just ramping up. It's crazy. So let's talk about some numbers. I did some research prior to this episode. So I got some numbers for our listeners here. Mm -hmm. The average ransom paid for organizations increased uh, in the U.S. from $115,000 in 2019 to about $312,000 in 2020. So that's about a 171% year-over-year increase. Additionally, the highest paid ransom in 2019 doubled from about $5 million to $10 million in 2020. So and you already, just talked about it quadrupling here in 2021 with CNA paying $40 million. So that starts to look like uh, exponential growth, if you ask me. Yep, yep. And then from 2015 to 2019, 
the highest ransomware demand was $15 million. So during those four years, no ransomware organization ever tried to even demand more than $15 million. In 2020, the highest demand grew to $30 million. And as Adam you know, rewound back, I had stated for the CNA Financial, that ransomware group demanded $60 million. And so... You know, that demand is starting to grow higher and higher, which means that the negotiation for lower payments is going to get higher. And so everyone's just paying more and more money for this. We're only halfway through 2021. And compared to 2020, there's already been a 102% increase in ransomware attacks. And the majority of those are concentrated in healthcare and utilities. So I'll, I'll put a link in the show notes to the blog that I referred to from Checkpoint on this data, but they are seeing a high number of healthcare industry and utility industry companies getting attacked from ransomware. And then another thing is the average cost of recovery has also more than doubled from 2021 or from 2020 to 2021. That was about $760,000, and now in this year, it's about $1.85 million in recovery. And we'll get into like where that money kind of is when it comes to recovery, but know that just the average cost of recovering from a cyber attack from ransomware is now roughly about almost $2 million. And then what I also found was interesting, too, is that Paying for the ransomware, which we've talked about in the past on some of our shows, should you pay, should you not pay? And even if you do pay, there's a risk. And the research actually supports that in that if you do pay for your data to try to get it back, there's very little guarantee that you're actually going to get it back. The studies show that about only 8% of companies that pay for getting their data back actually get all of their data back. And about 29% get some of it back. So a little more than, you know, 30%, close to 40% get some or all of their data back, which is not good odds. <laughs> Reminds me of that scene in the original Hangover movie when uh, he says, you mean to tell me the guy who sold you drugs wasn't a good guy? Like, we, there's stories that people pay the ransom. And then the decryption tools are too slow to be of any use. They take too long. They're not efficient at decrypting data. And even if you have a great decryptor that is super efficient and super fast and your data gets all decrypted and unlocked and it's good to go again, do you trust that machine? No, you don't. You don't trust it. Um, who knows what kind of root kits are on it or anything else that's lodged deep in the OS. I, I mean, at that point, you're still looking at a pave and rebuild. Yes, you got your data back, but is the data even completely safe? Is that potentially compromised? Like it's, it's not just an, and of course, this is something we have to land with non-technical leaders of our organizations that even if we pay the ransom, even if the decryptor works great, even if they give us the decryption keys, you know, and are a real straight shooter, <laughs> um, even then we still don't trust anything that had this compromising software on it, this, this ransomware. And ultimately we're still going to have to rebuild everything, whether we restore from backup or whether we decrypt. And I think that's another factor to consider as well. And then of course there's the whole like double exploit these days, right? Like if you say, I'm not going to pay just like HSE said, they're not going to pay. There's, a lot of ransomware gangs that are saying, okay, that's fine. We're just going to release your data into the forums mm -hmm. then. So there's that extra added threat of that's fine if you don't want to pay, but if you don't, we're going to release your data. So you better pay, right? So it's like kind of a double-edged sword. Like we encrypted it. We also stole it. And, you know, I think there was a, like Apple, this happened to Apple actually recently with uh, supplier Qantas, they were, they got hit by ransomware and then the designs for uh, one of the Apple devices got stolen because of it. And Apple said, yeah, we're not going to pay. And so that, you know, design just got released and I'm not sure what proprietary data was all involved in that, but they must've decided that the 
what the ransomware attackers got wasn't that Mm -hmm. important, you know, but it's still data, right? That there was their data and it was stolen and now it's being released. And so they chose not to pay, but that's that added threat that a lot of ransomware gangs have learned to kind of step up their game and demand more compliance, right? right? There's that added layer, the data exfiltration on top of the restoring operations. So the main point of our entire buildup of all of this is just kind of to try to guide cybersecurity professionals on when there is an, a cyber attack or a ransomware attack, how do you financially kind of prepare for this and where those hidden costs may be? Now, obviously, you want to hire a team. You know, that's all part of it, having bodies and seats and working for your company to try to defend your assets. But then where else are these other costs that may play into an incident? So I think the first thing that, we want to talk about is cyber insurance. That's kind of a big hot topic these days, whether you have it or whether you don't. But if you, if you do have it, it's kind of like, like that lifeline and it can help offset a large ransom demand. If you actually get hit with ransomware. Now, of course, if you have cyber insurance, you're paying for premiums. So that's a a cost that you have to roll into your budget. And I don't know how much that is, but I know that, and pre- premiums are going up year to year. There's some data that cyber insurance premiums went up 22% in 2020. And the industry itself is, is almost, almost $3 billion as a cyber insurance industry, which is pretty lucrative in itself. And then, of course, if you do have cyber insurance and you get hit by ransomware and you have to make a claim, there's usually a deductible. You know, whether whether it's like 10% or $100,000 or whatever it is, there's that cost that's associated with the attack as well because most of the time there is some sort of deductible. And then, you know, there's been some news, Adam, about how cyber insurance companies are starting to feel the pain from all of these events. I saw in one of the reports that I read that the direct loss ratio in 2020 is 73%. It was 47% in 2019, but it is now 73%, which for anybody who doesn't know about insurance and how, what that means, it, it, re, it means that for every dollar that they took in in premiums, they're paying 73 cents out in claims money, which is a pretty high ratio in the insurance industry. I mean, if you're, if your direct loss ratio is 73%, most of the time you're underwriting that policy essentially, right? So Des Moines is an insurance center. We have a lot of insurance here locally. So this, this is our, this is our business, man. This is, this is where we shine. Uh, that's, that's a uh, concerning direct loss ratio to say the least. And the actuaries are going to get to work on rate setting and risk analysis and everything else and, and try to get these uh, premiums dialed in here. And they're only going to go up. I mean, a lot, a lot go up and they might even go further up than they need to, because they almost have to predict what is going to be the continued growth of cyber crime moving forward, because they, they might be taking a bath this year already where they didn't, they didn't raise premiums high enough. And with the amount of claims that have come in this year and the very high dollar amounts at the top of the show, um, they might start, stop offering it. They might become more strict on proving that you weren't negligent as an organization in your security posture and that you had done enough. I have already, again, I should mention, work for Microsoft. I'm a, a security seller. Uh, I've had customers tell me that their cyber insurance is starting to become prescriptive on software packages they need to use or services they need to pay for to qualify for cyber insurance. It's just like, um, you know, life insurance, right? Yeah. They, they want to kind of do their due diligence on whatever asset they're insuring and, and make sure that you're taking care of it, essentially, whether it's your body or your security posture. 
Absolutely. And, and so th- th- all that to say, cyber insurance is, is not like a guarantee that it's going to continue to be there. It might just become um, almost untenable to, to have because it's not possible to set the rates properly. I, there's already stuff like this is already going on due to climate change with property casualty insurance, where it's becoming really, really hard to predict uh, and set rates appropriately because especially in the Southern United States, the frequency and intensity and duration of storms are becoming so frequent and so devastating that it's really hard to insure people's property in a place like in Alabama where the, the, the tornadoes and the storms are just hurricanes are so devastating. Um, it, it, this is, you know, totally different obviously, but still that same concept of the companies might start pulling back. Or it might just become a really hard business to be into. And so the idea that, well, we'll just, you know, we'll budget some premiums and we'll throw it at the insurance company. And then when we need money, we'll just give them a call. Um, that's that's probably going to change. Is, is long story short, there may be fewer offerings. And what is offered may come with more restrictions and more guidance and more prescriptive guidance on what you must do as an organization to continue to qualify um, to get a submit a claim and have it paid out on this policy in the future. And you mentioned this in the pre-show too, but maybe insurance companies will require you to buy bundles. You know, there as I was looking at the numbers on this, there was a percentage of companies that bought just cyber insurance, and then part of them that were a package where they had other insurance as as part of it. And so you're paying a premium to cover all the other things, and maybe companies will say, "Well, we can't just sell you cyber insurance because." it's too lucrative, right? We, we don't know what rate to give you or it's going to be extremely high. So we're going to force you to buy all this other insurance and roll cyber into it so that you're, you're paying as part of it. So. Mm-hmm. Which makes it less competitive, right? You as a organization, you probably already have a policy through some existing insurance relationship. And as opposed to being able to shop around for a really good policy on cyber, you may just have to go to whom you're insuring the rest of like your real estate and, and everything else through because they're the only ones that are going to offer it as part of a, a broader offering of multi-line policies. We'll see. Another thing that obviously plays into any type of cyber attack is incident response. So if you have your own team, you can certainly have your own incident response, a team dedicated to that if you're getting attacked all the time. Like a company like Microsoft, they have a dedicated SOC, they have a dedicated IR team internally, they even have something called a Dart team that goes out and helps out customers. So very big company. But if you're smaller, you may not have a dedicated IR team or a dedicated SOC. A lot of companies use a, an external IR team to come in and take a look at what happened during a cyber attack. Now, even if you have your own IR team, sometimes it's beneficial to have a third party come in, an independent party come in and kind of analyze, maybe double check your work. But for sure on smaller organizations, Mm -hmm. you're going to need to have this IR team come in because at smaller companies, most of the time, the cybersecurity professionals, they're doing their day job. There's all sorts of things that they have to keep up with incidents that they're having to do operational things, part of their job. And to put that on hold to do IR is pretty disruptive. And a lot of other things have to get put on hold. So having that IR team come in, take a look at, you know, the root cause, what the attackers did, if there was data taken, you know, any compromised credentials, vulnerable systems, et cetera, right? Giving you a report of the whole load down. Another bit of advice is to try to have a retainer for IR. You know, um, during major attacks, if you don't have an IR on standby, then you may not be able to get someone to come in to do IR because they're all busy. You know, like... I think back to the exchange uh, attack that happened a few months ago. And when all these companies were discovering these web shells and, and f- figuring out that they were breached and compromised, they wanted to find out how much damage was done. If you didn't have an IR retainer at that point, those companies that were doing IR, they were too busy. 
with other companies that had them on retainer to even take on a new customer. So that's another fee, again, you know, hidden costs. One, having a retainer costs money. You know, you're paying for something essentially to be there 24-7, 365 a year in case something happens. And then, of course, if you do use them, there's fees on top of that because the retainer fee is just to hold them, right, to, like, come in. (laughs) Um, And then, of course, you know, having an external IR team coming in in general is, is, you know, cost that you have to pay for. So those are all things that you want to consider when you're budgeting for this type of stuff. This is huge. And we talk about the hiring challenges in cybersecurity on the show frequently and the amount of unfilled cybersecurity jobs. And you think of incident response, obviously a very particular craft that requires a lot of training, a lot of expertise, a lot of experience. That's not something that can be spun up with a snap of fingers. And so when there is a industry wide event, like Andy spoke about with some of the exchange vulnerabilities that were disclosed a few months ago, there is going to be a rush for everybody to get instant response. And there's a finite amount of bodies to go around. And those bodies, those people are going to go to the people who've been paying a retainer. So this, this is something that it, not every event is going to be industry wide. Of course, those are going to be hopefully few and far between, but they will happen. There will be more. And you want to be prepared for those as well as the event that's unique to your organization. And I will have a little bit of a call out here. This is a good conversation to have. If you do have a support contract with Microsoft, like unified support or premier support that does make you eligible. Andy mentioned the dart team, the Microsoft incident response team that will actually come into your organization, help do your incident response that entitles you to request that service. Um, but there may be some details you need to work out or, or have understood ahead of time. But if you're already paying Microsoft for a support contract, you may already be eligible. That may more or less function as your retainer. Um, but I'm a little shaky on the details. It's not exactly what I do at, in my role. So speak to your customer success account manager or your account executive on that if you have that relationship, um, because that might be an opportunity to essentially have that already checked off and, and check that box is done deal. So something to look into again, I'm a little shaking all the details, but a conversation to have. Yeah, that's a good call out. I knew that the Dart team does provide IR services for the customers. And yeah, and I just you probably should just check in with the account exec to figure out what the exact details are to qualify for that. Mm-hmm. Legal. So let's talk about legal representation. Always important when it comes to a cyber attack. Most companies have some sort of internal legal organization already, but what they may specialize is not cybersecurity. They may be focused on contracts or maybe uh, litigation, NDAs, you know, those sorts of things. But when it comes to responding to an incident or cybersecurity in general, you know, there are, there are things that directly relate to that, that may not be their expertise. So number one, it's important to have legal counsel because they do a lot of things. If you're in a industry that requires some sort of reporting obligation, you know, they're going to know the requirements for that making sure that your communication is privileged in case you end up getting sued or going to court or some sort of litigation, you know, they're there to make sure that communications are privileged between you and possibly the opposing counsel that is going to be part of that litigation or lawsuit. And then, you know, whether or not paying a ransom is legal, you know, they're there internal counsel is there to kind of advise you for that. But if they're not, trained on how to handle this type of situation, you may have to go external, which is extremely expensive. Having external counsel for a corporation, you're normally getting charged anywhere from like 250 to like $700 an hour for external counsel. So make sure that you have some sort of budget for that in case that has to happen. Right. Good work. If you can get it. <laughs> But in, in all seriousness, this this is probably one of those things that a lot of people overlook. The importance of knowing 
what are your thresholds for public disclosure, how you disclose it, what you can and can't disclose, um, possibly negotiation help with the uh, cyber criminals or, or maybe point you at the direction of another professional who can help with that. All the things Andy just described, this is, this is an easy one to overlook, but, and I thought it's a really good call out too that your internal counsel may not have the experience to deal with this. That's a really good point where, you know, most organizations of course have, have a team of attorneys that do things like Andy talked about, like negotiations and contract review and, and that sort of thing. Uh, but these are a different skill set for cyber response and that's something you may have to go outside for. So, so really good call out here. I, I think that's going to be something where our listeners are going to go, man, I didn't think of that. And I bet my boss hasn't thought of that either, but it's an important call out. Communication is also really key during a incident response. You know, how you message it to your customers, how you message it to your employees. And so crisis communication comes to mind. And that should be part of your incident response plan. We've talked about this where you kind of have a list, like you should have some sort of binder or some sort of checklist. You know, back in the day in the military, we had these plans that we would just, you know, pull off the shelf. It was a binder of, you know, this happens. Okay, we'll pull it off the shelf. I've talked about this when I was in the military. I used to be part of the emergency management uh, flight when I was in the Air Force. And we'd have plans for different things, okay? So terrorist attack or biochemical attack or, you know, major aircraft um, accident. You know, those are all things that could happen. And we'd have these plans. We'd pull it off and you kind of go by checklist. One of those things should be how to communicate when there's an incident like this. You probably have a marketing team. You maybe have a social media team. But what they may not be versed in, again, just like legal, is they're good at promoting things and they're good at they're good at you know reacting or responding to things and and kind of boosting things but again it's a different skill set for crisis communication how do you word something so that it it puts your you know, and maybe it's part of where they would run this by legal too right the wording of how you're trying to eliminate not eliminate but reduce the risk or maybe fault you're not trying to spin it in the wrong way but you don't want to like make the company look bad but you also want to tell the truth at the same time right and so crisis communication you know if they don't know how to do that from an internal aspect that may be something that you have to also contract out to a firm that specializes in crisis communication which there are plenty out there IT support, that's obviously going to be part of any type of cybersecurity attack, right? But what happens in a lot of companies is that they don't realize the workload that's involved in kind of recovering from some of this stuff. And so part of that hidden cost is you realize, number one, on your people, and I think if you read through uh, Gavin Ashton's blog on his experience with NotPetya, he talks about the human toll that it takes, you know, just having to work 24-7 to spin Maersk back up and the, not seeing family and, and not doing any of those things. Like, that takes a, an emotional and mental toll on your employees. So that's part of it. And then, of course, like, if you don't have enough people to do the work, you have to then contract out and pay for services on top of that, which can be costly. So even though you obviously have IT, you're gonna it's gonna take an emotional and mental toll on your employees, and then you may have to pay extra as well to contract out. I always think of the time when I was going to deliver a security briefing to a customer, and literally the morning of the security briefing customer canceled on us because they had just suffered a security incident. And so as opposed to them coming to our office, we went to their office and met with them. And I will always remember the looks on their faces and, and the, the stress and wear and human toll, like you mentioned, Andy, that had been exacted on them. And I know that toll because I'd, I did a little bit of this when I was in IT. We had 
an email outage that had actually been the result of a vendor changing a configuration on us, unbeknownst to us, they were moving us to a new system and um, email just stopped working for the whole company for uh, I, I noticed it at like eight o'clock at night. So I drove over to the office um, just cause I thought it'd be easier to just handle it there literally in like what I wear to bed, which is like basketball shorts and a t-shirt. And I wound up spending the whole night on the phone with support, trying to get it fixed. Uh, night rolled into day, you know, 6 a.m., 7 a.m., 8 a.m., people started showing up in the office. And, you know, this is still like pre-COVID time. So, like, I was not dressed appropriately. I'd been up all night. I never expected to be there all night and ended up working through the day again till about 7 or 8 o'clock at night. And so now I've been up for, you know, who knows how many hours straight and I'm, I'm barely functional. Like I finally, we had it in somewhat of a fixed state and I left, I went and grabbed dinner and went home and collapsed into bed and, you know, slept for a long time, but woke up and I still was like completely foggy brained, still was not functional, not capable of doing my job. So now it's Friday morning. Like this incident had started like let's say Wednesday night at 8, 8, 8 p.m. And it, it's like, I, I can't, I can't function. I, I can't read the computer screen. I can't make heads and tails of it. I can't logic or reason. I, I have like the mental capacity here of a kindergartner. And it was more or less like I had to tell my coworker who had no experience with email systems, like just get on the phone with support and do what you can, you know, to keep working the problem. Cause I am, I am unable to. And you think of that wear and tear over multiple, not just days, but potentially weeks of restoration, you're going to need Safog to do this because your people alone can't do it. It's, it's not something they, they know how to do um, because nobody's really ever rebuilt a complete network from scratch before in 2021. That's really, really hard to do. And you're just going to need Staffog to be able to throw things to people and say, Hey, can you just, you know, click next a bunch of times and install exchange server, whatever you need somebody to do. But you you just have to have people come in and be able to hand off things to them. It's there's, there's no way to do this without out staff log. And so this is something that really affects me very personally that I remember the experience I went through on a much, much lesser scale where it was not a security incident it was just a, a, you know, real cluster. Um, but I think of the faces and the, and the human toll I have personally witnessed when I've walked into an organization that was in the middle of this and, and I could tell people had not slept in one or two nights. And it's, it's, um, this is, this is another cost of like, don't just assume your existing team is going to be able to handle it. Cause quite frankly, they almost certainly cannot. And that's not a failure on their part. It's just a fact of they don't have the skills. They've never been asked to do it. And sometimes there's more there when you're trying to build things new then keeping the lights on. Those are two totally different skills, two totally different volumes of work effort. And then obviously the ransom payment itself is a cost of the cyber attack or the ransomware attack. I don't know if we talked about this previously, but I remember when ransomware was kind of big in the news a few months back and my boss, Doug, actually asked our team, me specifically, like, hey, do you think we should have a Bitcoin wallet ready to pay out for ransomware and maybe budget for this? And I, I thought about it for a little bit, and I thought that might not be a bad idea. Maybe we should have some sort of fund ready there and budgeted there to go because it takes time to spin up, you know, buy Bitcoin, have a wallet, all of that stuff. And so... That's something you should budget for because let's be honest here, it's more likely than not that you're going to get hit by some sort of cyber attack and hopefully it's not a bad ransomware, but it could be. And in our industry, we say it's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when you're going to get attacked, right? Assume breach. And so that I think is something that you are going to want to think about to budget for and have ready kind of just in case. Mm -hmm. So this episode was mainly about trying to kind of inform our cybersecurity professionals on 
the actual cost and monetary financial cost of a cyber attack, a ransomware attack. And, you know, hopefully you can take back some of this information to the decision makers and present to them an actual financial dollar amount on what the risk may be because it's happening more and more often. Right. So that's, that was the point, And I think our, our hope in having this conversation tonight. Use this show today to build out that plan. Like Andy's talking about and not just build out a potential cost, but have a plan because we, we called out several things here of like, can, is, can your internal legal counsel handle those kind of conversations? Can your internal communications team handle the, the responsibilities here? And then we talk on the show a lot about sometimes getting funding for cybersecurity is hard because it's really difficult to go to somebody who's so used to functioning in dollars and cents, like a chief financial officer, CFO, and get them to fund and make investment in cybersecurity. Well, if you build out that plan and you start to set dollar amounts to all of these things that become way more than just pay the deductible to the insurance company and, you know, we're good and help them understand that like, this is way more than this. This is way, way more. Now we can start to set an idea of what all this is going to cost. They can clearly see, because we talked about at the top of the show that it's going mainstream. Now people are having impacts in their day-to-day lives because of cyber attacks that there's the potential here to turn an ear or maybe get more buy-in and more investment and more funding because more than ever, the impacts are so visceral. The frequency is greater. And now you have this plan of all these things that, Hey, if we didn't think about as cybersecurity professionals, certainly maybe people in the financial space did not think about either And you might be able to make that compelling argument for here's why we need to invest in protection. Here's why we need to invest in additional headcount. Here's why we need to invest in additional tooling. So this can serve two goals at the same time, because it's really good to have this plan in place and to have some of these ideas in place of who's on retainer for incident response, who's on retainer for legal response, who's on retainer for communications, crisis communications response. And build all of that out while at the same time, you can also take this and use it as a potential justification for increasing the investment of the organization in cybersecurity to perhaps prevent this, or if not prevent it outright to reduce the, um, the intensity of the attack, like how much they're able to get to how much damage they're able to do. If we can, you know, cordon off that blast radius, as we kind of talk about with that defense in depth strategy, then we win as well. So that's uh, kind of two birds with one stone here tonight on the show, which is awesome. That's our show for this week. Thanks for listening. As always, our contact information will be in the show notes. If you guys have follow-up questions about the episode or you have topics that you want us to talk about, please message us. We'll talk to you guys next week. Thank you for listening to the Blue Security Podcast. Please check out the show notes, catch up on episodes you may have missed, and subscribe so you don't miss any future episodes. Find Andy on Twitter at AJAWZERO and Adam at AJ Brewer. See you at our next episode.